Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Howenstein Center and welcome to the third annual Midwestern uh, History Conference. Uh, I want to extend uh, the appreciation of the Midwestern History Association uh, to Gleaves Whitney and the Howenstein Center for hosting us once again. This conference has uh, really taken off in the past few years. Uh, it started in a dimly lit bar in Wisconsin. Kathy Borkowski was there. We were talking about that last night. About 20 of us uh, sitting around complaining about not enough Midwestern history. And it's grown since then. Uh, it's really taken uh, flight. And we uh, are very happy with the growth of the association and the creation of the uh, journals related to Midwestern history. But none of this could have been possible without the support of the Howenstein Center here at Grand Valley State University, and in particular, the personal leadership of uh, Gleaves Whitney, the director of the Howenstein Center. Uh, just a quick bit of background uh, since yesterday, I've lost track of time. I think yesterday was the anniversary of D Day. Um, one of the people that planned the landing at D-Day and coordinated all of the intelligence for the Allied forces landing at D-Day was Ralph Howenstein, who was a local uh, Michigan boy who uh, also worked and was an editor at the local Grand Rapids uh, newspaper uh, for many years and then went on to be a prominent businessman in the food industry. But it, is due to the generosity of Ralph Howenstein that this center exists and that we are able to have programs like this. The last two meetings of our association uh, here at the Howenstein Center, Ralph was in the front row at 103 years old, uh, listening to our conversations and was very supportive of our efforts because he was a Midwestern boy himself. So I want to uh, I want to remind you to keep the history of the Howenstein Center in, in mind and their generosity, and please extend your thanks to Gleaves Whitney and the Howenstein Center staff, in particular, Anne, Anne O'Keefe, and uh, Scott St. Louis. Um, coming up to the podium next will be Scott St. Louis to introduce our morning speaker, uh, Michael Barone. Scott St. Louis is a proud graduate of Grand Valley State University, a history major, and is going to be heading off to a PhD program in history in coming years. So, Scott, would you uh, come up and introduce our morning speaker? Well, uh, thank you so much, John, and good morning, everyone. Uh, from everyone at the Howenstein Center, thank you for coming from near and far to join us for the third annual Midwestern History Conference right here in Grand Rapids. As John said, my name is Scott St. Louis and I serve as program manager of the Howenstein Center's Common Ground Initiative. And it's my pleasure to give a brief introduction for our first speaker of the day, Michael Barone, who is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. and a senior political analyst for the Washington Examiner. He's authored many books on American politics and history, which have been published by Crown, Free Press, and others. Since 1972, he's also served as a co-author for the Biennial Almanac of American Politics, which is a great big book that looks something like this. It features in-depth and up-to-date profiles of all 50 states and their governors, all 100 senators, all 435 congressional districts and their House representatives, and the District of Columbia and US territories. The 2018 edition of the Almanac is scheduled for release next month. Of the 2016 edition, uh, Chuck Todd from Meet the Press on N NBC has said, real political junkies get two copies, one for home and one for the office. <laughs> Judy Woodruff of, P of PBS has called the Almanac simply the oxygen of the political world, and her PBS colleague, Jim Lehrer, has described it as the single best reference there is for Congress and Washington specifically, and the country generally. The Washington Post has praised the Almanac as indispensable, a compendium of statistics and information that has gone as far as humanly possible. Michael's presentation is titled, The Surprising New Political Battleground of the Midwest. Please help me give him a warm welcome. Well, thanks very much, Scott. It's uh, a pleasure and an honor to be here, and I want to thank the Howenstein Center, John Lauk, uh, Gleaves Whitney, um, all of you who have come to this. I'm 
uh, a native of Michigan. I have people ask me where I'm from. I tell them I grew up north of Canada, uh, which is true. And of course, there's usually a look of puzzlement and things like that. And then I explain that I grew up in northwest Detroit and Birmingham, Michigan. Uh, we didn't get out to Grand Rapids very much. That was just the, the woods or something. But uh, the uh, much less McCoster and the Russell Kirk Center or whatever. But the, uh, as uh, Scott suggested, I have gone from uh, one profession to another in my speckled career, uh, each one of which has tended to pay less and to have a lower level of honest, a intellectual honesty and integrity than the one before. So I started off with law, um, then I moved uh, slightly down to political consulting, uh, then a real drop in honesty and intellectual integrity going down to journalism. And there's only one thing left, which is academia. Uh, so um, it's, it's nice to be here in this beautiful building. Uh, I've been sort of assigned as my topic, uh, by, if not by the Howenstein Center, then by events, um, the surprising new political background, the Middle West. Uh, the Middle West has sort of uh, been taken uh, for granted in recent election cycles. Uh, people pass over it, uh, the, you know. You have a gaggle of political reporters who go to Iowa at the worst weather time of the year uh, and then abandon the place. Uh, you have people looking through the uh, political entrails of Ohio in the uh, general election, which turns out not to have been a close race in the presidential race this year. Uh, but mainly they're, you know, looking at the far, you know, the new Hispanic neighborhoods in California and Arizona and with, you know, you have, uh, they choose to put their campaign headquarters in Washington or for some reason Brooklyn. Um, and uh, we, they don't see much, but um, the, the, the fascinating fact, something people really weren't predicting, is that the key votes in the 2016 presidential election were cast in the Midwest. Uh, and uh, not by those people in the trendy bars in Brooklyn or by Hispanic immigrants to the Southwest. Um, and of the 100 electoral votes that switched from Democratic in 2012 uh, to Republican in 2016, um, and that's a pretty big shift. I mean, we have been a period of, of static political polarization and static partisan lines. There haven't been much change in uh, one election to the other. I mean, to, between 2000 and 2004, the number of electoral votes that changed party was um, 15 out of 538. Uh, this time, it was 100. Uh, 50 of those were in the Midwest, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa. 20 more were in Pennsylvania, which west of uh, Metro Philadelphia, uh, demographically and attitudinally more closely resembles the Midwest and the rest of the Northeast. Uh, you can see the difference in the culture. I had a conversation at the Democratic National Convention this summer with Dennis Kucinich, the former Democratic Congressman from Cleveland, and he said, uh, you know, and I'd been at the Republican Convention in Cleveland, he said, how are the people treating you here? How do you get along with the people in the town? And I said, gee, in Cleveland, everybody was really friendly and nice and helpful. And I said, in Philadelphia, they've really been trying to be friendly and nice and helpful, but, but it's hard for them. Uh, <laughs> doesn't come naturally. Uh, in addition, when you look at that electoral map, uh, you see that uh, uh, 29 electoral votes switched in Florida, where the key Obama to Trump movement came in small counties along the Gulf Coast uh, and north of Orlando, heavily inhabited by former Midwesterners. Uh, you can, uh, I, I recommend the passage in the book Shattered by Jonathan Allen and Amy Parnes uh, about the Hillary Clinton campaign, uh, just for the scene that they report very well when the Clinton people on election night are beginning to realize and that pit of the stomach moment somewhere between 8, 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. that their campaign is gonna lose. Uh, it's a classic. Uh, it's, it's like the novel, uh, The Last, Edwin O'Connor's The Last Hurrah, where the protagonist, the old mayor, is realizing that he's gonna lose an election when the first precinct comes in and the numbers are not quite what they should be. And, uh, and, it's, um, and it, that helps to explain a lot of what happened. Uh, additionally, we had another um, uh, one electoral vote changed uh, in the second congressional district of Maine, which has certain climatological and um, forest uh, 
tree con uh, resemblances to the north of Michigan. Um, it, uh, it was the Midwest uh, with, that won the election, that swung the election, that changed the result, and whatever one thinks of the result, um, this was a consequential region of the country. Um, standard analysis, we've read often, uh, is that significant numbers of white non-college graduates shifted from Obama to Trump, from Democratic to Republican, uh, and that these voters are concentrated in the Midwest. And that's true as far as it goes. Uh, when you look at the uh, numbers, you know, the white non-college vote uh, is a demographic group that people look at now. Um, you see that that's, uh, in fact, uh, where you see the shift. It's not a huge shift in terms of percentage of the total electorate. It is a hugely decisive switch in terms of who is president of the United States. Um, and, but I think uh, that to understand what's going on, um, I think that you have to, or at least I will propose to, uh, look not just at present uh, events, but also at history. I think history has its claims on people. History tells the story. It shapes attitudes in ways that people are not often aware of them themselves. And my proposition here today is that there are three pivotal dates in Midwestern history um, of events. I call them extreme events, um, like extreme weather, um, for, uh, that, have, that have been quite unusual events and which have shaped Midwestern attitudes in history. Uh, the dates are 1787, 1854, and 1937. How many in this room remember any one of those dates here? <laughs> I'm looking. Ralph Howenstein would have remembered 1937 uh, if he'd been with us just another year or two. Um, but that's, we're talking about 230, 163, and 80 years ago. Um, and only a few Midwestern voters were alive for the most recent of these. Um, almost none grew up with parents in this, who grew up in the second. But sometimes the influence of people lingers on in ways that we can't be aware. Uh, have any of you ever visited the home of the 10th President John Tyler in, in uh, just uh, south of Richmond, Virginia, along the James River? Um, he didn't qualify as a Midwesterner, but he was on the Tippecanoe and Tyler II ticket that carried the Midwest in 1840. Um, he was, well, John Tyler was born in 1790. The house is owned by his grandson, one of his two living grandsons. Uh, it was born in 1928. Uh, so uh, we're that close to a man who was born in the first full year of George Washington's presidency. Uh, the, uh, so, the first date, 1787, I suppose when I mention it, the first thing you think of is the Constitutional Convention. Um, you folks are interested in history. I understand they don't teach the Constitutional Convention anymore in most of our colleges and universities. Um, you know, it's, uh, we, we have other subjects that we think are important, and evidently that one isn't. Uh, but, um, you know, if they'd had a few women in there, might have been different, but they didn't, so there we are. Uh, but the extreme event I'm, I'm referring to is the passage uh, by the Confederation Congress in July 13th when the Constitutional Convention was meeting behind those closed doors and closed windows in the heat of Philadelphia uh, that, uh, of, the, of the Northwest Ordinance. Uh, this was an updating of a plan that Thomas Jefferson had advanced and that the Confederation Congress had considered. Um, and this covered the way that they would organize and make new states out of the territory west of Pennsylvania, north of the Ohio River, the territory where we are today. Uh, and they, um, uh, they provided that these would be new states and not extensions of the old states, which had, some of which had claims going west to the Mississippi River. But they also uh, provided there wouldn't be slavery in that territory. That's pretty extraordinary when you think about it. Only five of the 13 original states at that time uh, banned slavery, and in fact, they had provided for gradual emancipation of slaves. You know, if you live to be 60, you might become free, um, and uh, that was. And yet, they banned slavery in that territory. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't found references to exactly why, and some of you may have better idea than I do. But I think that that ban on slavery crucially shaped the culture and economy of the states uh, of the majority of Midwesterners. Uh, it encouraged. Uh, the Northwest Ordinance encouraged uh, 
land holding by selling land, by providing for the cheap sale of land to people that would work it. It encouraged education by setting aside one of the 16 seconds sections of the typical township for schools. And schools and co colleges started springing up in uh, the Midwest in the early 19th century uh, to a degree that was uh, very different from what you got in south of the Ohio River, south of the Northwest Ordinance Territory. Uh, and the ban on slavery, of course, affected who would move there. People that uh, wanted large numbers of slaves generally didn't come to this. You had a lot of migration from south of the Ohio River, from Virginia, Kentucky, uh, in the antebellum eras, uh, unlike after the Civil War where you have almost no south to north migration between the Civil War and World War II. Uh, but you, you don't get the slaves, and that affected their attitudes. Um, and, you know, there's an interesting episode in the history of Illinois, uh, and a couple books have been written recently by academics uh, about uh, Governor Edward Coles. Um, Edward, uh, Illinois was admitted to the Union in 1818, a non-slave state as provided by the Northwest Ordinance, uh, paired, as I recall, with Mississippi, which is admitted in, in 18, uh, no, Alabama in 1819. Um, but the, uh, Edward Coles was a young man, rich family, Virginia slaveholders, was a sort of chief staffer to, uh, to, I don't know, he was the Reince Priebus to James Madison. Uh, I think, I don't know what time is, I think Reince Priebus is still White House Chief of Staff, okay. Uh, they, uh, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, at a young age, he inherited uh, property and slaves, and he decided to free his slaves. He took them on a journey up down the river and so forth, Ohio River, uh, to Illinois. And on the way, he told them that, A, I'm going to free you, two, I'm buying land for you and uh, so forth, and you will be free, and you can farm your land and make your living and do live as you like. Um, you know, it's kind of an extra prize. Uh, the, uh, this was, uh, Edward Coles was elected governor of Illinois in 1822. There was a move then to legalize slavery in Illinois. And as you know, a lot of these northwestern states were not, you know, real friendly to black people in the way that we would like them to have been. Uh, they sometimes banned black people from moving in and so forth uh, in the antebellum period. But they, uh, <coughs> they had a big debate and a variety of measures in the legislature and referendum in Illinois. And Edward Coles fought successfully to prevent uh, the uh, legalization of slavery in Illinois, which would have changed a lot of history when you think about it. Uh, there wouldn't have been a Dred Scott case because when he was brought to Illinois, it would have been slave territory and there wouldn't have been any issue of whether he was free. Um, there wouldn't have been probably an electorate that might have been friendly to the position taken by Abraham Lincoln in the 1858 debates with, Lincoln, with Douglas and, the, uh, and to the position of the Republican Party and against extension of slavery and so forth. Um, if Illinois had been a slave state, we would have had a very different history. Uh, so sometimes... Small decisions made a long time ago uh, are not, uh, have a considerable effect really on people's attitudes, voting behavior, the culture, the political culture of a polity for many years afterwards. Um, and so um, the Midwest developed as it did. It was honeycombed with, uh, by the 1850s, it was honeycombed by railroad and telegraph lines. Uh, I went back and looked at the maps of, Rail, rail and telegraph lines in the U.S. in 1854, 1856, whatever those years. And the Midwest and the South are just like a different country. Uh, they're all over the Midwest. There's just very little in the South. Um, and people who, you know, read the history of the Civil War know that. That's, that's another little topic they kind of skip over in most colleges and universities is unnecessary, uninteresting, and so forth. Um, and you had, you had huge population growth. This was an era of tremendous upheaval. Economically, there was great economic growth. You had much um, better transportation and communication than you had had two years previously when most of the adults of the 1850s had grown up. You were getting immigrants from the Midwest, some from Ireland, lots from different parts of Germany uh, and uh, different places. Uh, you had the creation and proliferation of colleges uh, like Oberlin, uh, Hillsdale, which from the beginning ban uh, allowed blacks and women to enroll and to be educated and to get college degrees. Uh, 
a real pioneering measure. It was that, that sort of New England Yankee reformism, that spirit that the people of Yankee descent brought with them on their westward diaspora across upstate New York, across Lake, Lake Erie down into north, particularly northeast Ohio, the Western Reserve, southern Michigan, uh, little parts of Indiana, Chicago, skipping west to Iowa. Uh, that reformist impulse found itself in movements for women's rights, uh, for abolition of slavery, uh, for temperance, banning alcohol, for an end of capital punishment. Michigan banned capital punishment uh, in 1855 and has never changed that position in the years since. Um, and uh, that, th those, in that sort of whirlwind, you, this is where uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe lived in Cincinnati in the Midwest, across the Ohio River from Kentucky, slave territory. And she wrote a little book, uh, as President Lincoln said, aren't you the, the little lady that started this war? Uh, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, this Midwest was buzzing with things, and it's in that atmosphere that we come to my second date, extreme event, uh, 1854, uh, the year the Republican Party was created. It was, uh, uh, the Republican Party, by my count, is the third oldest political party in the world, the Democratic Party being the oldest, 1832, uh, the first Democratic National Convention. Uh, you get the Conservative Party in Britain is created in 1846 when, um, the, uh, when uh, Benjamin Disraeli revolts from uh, and undermines Sir Robert Peel after they've repealed, after they've abolished the corn laws and introduced free trade to Britain uh, and the Republican Party in 1854. Um, I, I gave a lecture at Hillsdale about 10 days ago uh, making the point that the character of those parties in many ways owes itself to uh, the events of its founding. The Democratic Party was a collection of out people, the South, the old Southwest, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, with the big cities in Pennsylvania and so forth. Uh, the Conservative Party was a party where its first leader stabbed the, uh, in the back the political leader that it had previously had. Well, the Conservative Party last summer, you saw them uh, have a, throw out one prime minister, uh, have, uh, you know, people endorse, you know, Michael Dove, Doris Boris Johnson, then got, then de-endorsed him and so forth, and Theresa May came in to be prime minister. The Conservative Party is a party where there is deep mistrust and hatred between its various political players to a much greater extent than any American political party. Uh, the backstabbing, yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, and, the, uh, and the Republican Party, and the Republican Party was basically a party, it was created deliberately to be a party formed around a core of people, a core group that was thought by themselves and by many other people to be typical Americans, but they weren't a majority of the whole population. And what happened in this uh, churning economic, uh, political, cultural churning in the 1850s there were moves to have a temperance party. There was moves to have an anti-immigration party, the so-called know-nothings. Uh, and the Republican Party uh, is created um, almost instantly. Uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. We think in the internet age, suddenly stuff happens faster. Uh, well, it happened faster than in, 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 in January 1st, 1854. Um, nobody knew there was gonna be a Republican Party. Seven months later, it existed and it won uh, enough uh, congressional seats in the elections that were held in various months that fall uh, to elect uh, in a coalition Speaker of the House of Representatives. Uh, you have ja January 1854, uh, Stephen Douglas, um, looking to promote a transcontinental railroad, introduces the Kansas-Nebraska Act, changing, opening the West to slavery, popular sovereignty. Um, he's, uh, then you get a meeting of, uh, of anti-slavery, uh, anti-extension of slavery Democrats, Whigs, Free Soilers in Ripon, Wisconsin in February. They say we gotta put together something else. Uh, in March, the Kansas-Nebraska Act passes the Senate. Uh, and in May, it passes the House of Representatives. It's a little faster pattern than in today's internet to think uh, major legislation. It's signed by President Pierce uh, and uh, in July, Kansas-Nebraska opponents hold a meeting in Jackson, Michigan, not very far from here, and create what they call a Republican Party and adopt a platform. Seven months, uh, suddenly, this party springs into existence. Uh, 
Uh, and here we are, what, 163 years later, uh, and it's still around. Um, this, was, uh, uh, this was an astonished thing. And the basic uh, premise of the Republican Party was to prevent the extension of slavery. Uh, and it was the North only party. They had seen that the Whig party had fallen apart because of dispute between people from Whigs from the slave states and the, uh, and the, and the free states. Uh, and the Republicans say, we're not gonna have that problem. We're just distributing ballots. And remember in those days, the parties distributed the ballots in the Northern states. Uh, we're not gonna run anywhere else. We want a core group. And if you, if you look at a map of the counties that were carried by the first Republican nominee, John C. Fremont in 1856, it's a map of the westward New England diaspora. It, almost all of New England except New Hampshire was a little contrary, which it still is. Uh, upstate New York, but not New York City. Uh, that divide is there. Northeast Ohio, Northeast Ohio, the Western Reserve uh, was really the most Republican district in the whole country uh, in uh, the late 19th century. Um, and, you know, about 70%. Uh, then, in, you know, southern Michigan, parts of Indiana going out to Illinois, northern Illinois, and the counties that were carried for uh, Republican legislative candidates in 1858 when the legislature had the choice of electing Douglas or Lincoln to the Senate, uh, and then uh, in those areas. In t four years later, Abraham Lincoln is the nominee. They add a lot of the German uh, counties. Uh, there had been a lot of anti-immigrant movement. Lincoln positioned himself shrewdly and on principle as a non-anti-immigrant non person, and this helped him. Uh, they add to that, and basically they win every electoral vote in the South, uh, and they, they uh, they get something like 1,300,000 votes in the free states and 29,000 votes in the slave states. Uh, it's a pretty stark difference. It's a regional party, and it's a party that had a platform of saying, we're gonna do a bunch of things that use any power of the federal government we can to discourage and impede uh, slavery in the southern states. Uh, the South, when they seceded, um, had reason to be apprehensive of what the Republicans were doing. Uh, and when you take a look at the numbers, uh, Lincoln carries the Midwest 49-43 over Douglas. Uh, it, his electoral vote margin is 66 to 9. Uh, Missouri went for a slave state, the only slave state in the Midwest as I define it, went for um, Douglas. Uh, and basically, Republican presidential nominees carried the Midwest popular vote. Uh, not always by wide margins, but they carried it in every election from 1860 to 1928 with the single exception of 1912 when you have Theodore Roosevelt running against William Howard Taft and the Republican vote is split. If you add up the Taft and Roosevelt vote, it's a clear majority. Um, and so this region tended to go Republican and I would submit the sort of ideas which animated the Republican Party, which were opposition to slavery and in, at least to some considerable extent equal rights for black Americans, uh, encouragement of business, industry, invention, technology, uh, and uh, production. Uh, the Democrats were a more laissez-faire agrarian party. Uh, and um, encouragement of education, of higher education learning uh, and promotion of uh, classical education. Uh, those were all things that the Republican Party, and I think in many ways that platform that appealed to people in this region also over time, over generations, shaped their uh, their attitudes and so forth. Um, those economic changes produced some challenges for the Republican Party uh, and uh, for the Midwest. Uh, in 1896, you get the, uh, the William Jennings Bryan platform for free silver, inflationary currency, so farmers could pay off their debts with cheaper money, pitched very much to the farmers. It looked like he was gonna carry the Midwest. Uh, William McKinley and uh, the Republican nominee from Canton, Ohio, uh, uh, figures out how to run a campaign against him using the Republican stand of hard uh, currency. A friendliness to labor unions and to the working man, uh, which is an interesting uh, aspect. The New Deal historians don't pick this up because they want to see um, the 1890s as just another 1930s. It was rather different. Uh, I recommend Carl Rove's recent book, The Triumph of William McKinley, which shows how McKinley adapted uh, this thing. And by the way, McKinley uh, put his campaign headquarters in Chicago, in the Midwest. He, uh, 
hired a 30-year-old guy named Charles G. Dawes uh, to run his campaign out of Chicago. And uh, Dawes later becomes the head of the first Bureau of the Budget, Vice President of the United States in the 1920s. Uh, a distinguished career that's, that's picked at age 30 by uh, McKinley, who was a good spotter of political talent. Chicago, in many ways, was also becoming thought of as the center of the United States. I mean, it had grown from you know 6,000 people in Fort Dearborn in 1833 to a city of well over a million people by 18. 90 and 1893, you had that great exposition, which is still remembered in so many ways. Uh, you have Chicago, the international, the, the nationalizing organizations that are taking a segmented society and trying to impose a national order on it. The American Bar Association, the American Medical Association, uh, American Political Science, Historical Association. So, um, they say the natural place to put our headquarters is Chicago center of the railroad network, sort of the geographical center of the country, bracing winter climate, keeps people working hard. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and, and, uh, and if you look at the, if you sort of do the kind of projections that we'll see, to, you know, that we often see today, you know, if the movement of popul if population increase goes the way it does in the last 10 years, you know, they're gonna be whatever. 88 million people in Arizona by 2030 or 2130 or something like that, you know. Uh, you, you could very well envisage Chicago as becoming the largest city in the country uh, if you look at the censuses of this period. As it turned out, uh, Chicago got a great boom of immigrants from the, what I call the Ellis Island years, 1892, 1924, uh, but New York got an even bigger influx and New York remained the largest city in the country, um, even though it's culturally distinct from the other uh, places, but I don't, in a conference on Midwest history, I don't want to go sidetracked into New York. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, one of the other things that happens in the 20th century is that the early 20th century, the United States was faced with a fight of whether or not to get into a world war, a truly momentous decision. I mean, when you think about it, the original first American party system created in the 1790s, part over argument over Hamilton's economic financial program, but also about which side to back in a world war between France and Britain. Jefferson favored France, Hamilton favored Britain. Uh, American public was split. George Washington, I would argue, it kept us together as a country in a way that probably no other leader could have done. Uh, but that party system waned after there was no, the world war ended. Britain won. There was no more, that issue disappeared and uh, the party, the, the Federalist Party disappeared and so forth. In the early 20th century, we're faced again with the World War. And what we see in the Midwest, uh, and particularly in those regions of the Midwest that have what I call Germano-Scandinavian America. I mean, you, uh, Wisconsin, Iowa, uh, Minnesota, the Dakotas, much of Nebraska. Uh, this becomes the part of the country that is most inclined towards pacifism, isolationism, um, uh, dovishness. Uh, consistently. Uh, declaration of War in 1917, uh, 39 of the 56 votes are cast against the war uh, by senators and representatives from the Midwest. It was mostly a Midwest thing, Robert La Follette of, of uh, Wisconsin being the most uh, uh, prominent of them. Uh, and you get, uh, and so that attitude continues to be an important part of this, uh, this uh, development. Uh, and the Republican Party tends to affect it, but it affects Midwestern voting patterns. So you see uh, in those years when the uh, revolt against the stifling Midwest, a place where steady habits, delayed gratification, education has provided technological progress, economic growth, and so forth, something obviously that a young intellectual must rebel against. Uh, John Locke has described it in his book, uh, uh, the, uh, and the, uh, from Warm Center to, many, uh, and so forth. Um, the, the Midwest uh, keeps voting basically for the Republican Party uh, in a very large majority, uh, in large majorities in the 1920s. Um, and so, um, and supports, uh, tends to support, with some exceptions, the uh, 
the, the reformist, the New England Yankee reformist measures that re result in two constitutional amendments that come right after World War I, the 18th Amendment prohibiting liquor and the 19th Amendment enfranchising women. You can argue that one or the other, or maybe even both, were mistakes. H.L. Mencken, the famous editor, did so, but uh, the fact is that that was, those, those were generally uh, popular here. It was part of the, uh, the development. Uh, and that leads us to my third date of extreme events, 1937. Um, the Great Depression moved the Midwest uh, toward the Democratic Party, away from the Republican Party, as it did the rest of the country. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt won all 161 Midwestern electoral votes in the two elections in the 1930s. Um, and in 19, December 1936, after that second election, you had uh, the workers at Flint, uh, Michigan, General Motors plants sitting in, down in the plants, in effect occupying and taking over the property of General Motors and saying, you're not going to produce any more cars until you recognize the uh, United Auto Workers as a bargaining agent under the National Labor Relations Act. And we want to do this quickly because we think in June the Supreme Court's going to throw the National Labor Relations Act out, so we want you to act right now. Uh, these strikes spread in other parts of the industrial Midwest, and you have uh, the governors of uh, Michigan, Ohio, uh, and Illinois, make it, Democratic governors, make it clear that they're not going to enforce the law because all the people who, including many people who memorialized the sit-down strikes as a great and consequential change, which I think they were, um, they were plainly illegal then and illegal now. They're not, these were not legal actions, but the, uh, the decision was made that when you had this large number of people there, you weren't going to enforce the law, and we get the unionization of the auto industry, and we get the creation of the CIO industrial unions, of which the most prominent, particularly here in Michigan, was the United Auto Workers. I mean, when I was involved in democratic politics in Michigan in the 1960s and 70s, uh, you, just ref you just said the, the term, the union. You didn't have to ask. People say, oh, you're talking about the teachers' union? No, 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 you're talking about the UAW. Uh, that was very, that was a huge, it was a dominant force and it affected, I think, people's opinions. I mean, the isolationist impulse of the Midwest uh, kept it as a very closely divided, uh, region in the elections of uh, 1940 and 1944. Uh, in 19, uh, 1940, Roosevelt carried the region over Indiana's Wendell Wilkie by uh, one-tenth of one percent in the popular vote. It was a tie, essentially. Um, Wilkie was from Indiana, but he lived on, um, he, he lived on, had an apartment on Fifth Avenue overlooking the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, Owasso, Michigan native Thomas Dewey beats Roosevelt 50-49 in 1944 uh, and so forth. Truman carries the Midwest by arguing that Republicans are going to abolish the farm subsidies, but only by a 50 to 48 margin in, in 1948. That sort of Republican tilt being somewhat more Republican than the national average continues in the post-war period. Um, but it's also, it, it starts to be shaped by the union uh, movement. I mean, when I was growing up in Michigan in the 1950s, 40% of Michigan voters were in union households, nearly a majority. Uh, we're one, you know, one member of the household was a union voter. Metro Detroit voted 60-40 for the Kennedy-Johnson ticket in 1960 in an election which the national popular vote was 50-50. Uh, and, um, and starting basically around that time in the late 1960s, um, and going up through and including uh, 2008, uh, the Midwest was slightly more democratic region in presidential elections than the rest of the country. Uh, big exception is when uh, Grand Rapids' own Jerry Ford, 1976, runs against Jimmy Carter from the historic Democratic uh, South Georgia, uh, which was uh, still, uh, you know, had remained democratic. I mean, Here's a, here's a bar bet question you can do with people. What was John F. Kennedy's number two state and percentage of the vote in, 19, uh, in 1960? And you can stipulate for your betting partner that the number one state was Rhode Island, which was the most Catholic state in the country. And the nature of the question suggests that the answer is not Massachusetts, which was Kennedy's home state and the number two Catholic state. So people are puzzled, just like when you tell them you grew up north of Canada. And <laughs> the answer is Georgia. Why was Georgia the number two democratic state for a Catholic guy from Massachusetts, more liberal and so forth, purportedly? 
Um, the answer is it was only 96 years that, uh, since Sherman marched through. Uh, you know, that was a recent event in people's minds. There's a song called Marching Through Georgia, which was a Sherman song, and when you played that song, Jimmy Carter would get really angry if he heard him playing Marching Through Georgia. He, he didn't like hearing that. Uh, history has its effect on people who were unborn, generations unborn at the time. Uh, and uh, that generation, that, that sort of North versus South in a way, had its last reprise in the 1976 presidential election. I mean, Jerry Ford carried Ann Arbor and Marin County, okay, uh, in that election. Uh, areas that in the most recent election uh, gave uh, less than 20% of their votes to Donald Trump. Uh, this was, uh, that was the old days. Um, I'll pass over some of the more recent elections, but just note that one of the things that happens in the Midwest, Michigan, not only Michigan, but a lot of the Midwest in that period is that um, at the presidential level, it votes about the same as the national average, and I could go over each of the elections. I think you all know uh, how those things have developed and how we've had for the last 20 years a period of real partisan stasis with the election. You know, the best way to predict the 2004 election is predict that they'll vote the same way they did in 2000. That gives you a really good prediction. Uh, don't even look at the current polls and so forth. The, uh, but the uh, but the Democrats advance at the lower level, and I think uh, the union movement has something to do with this. The feeling of being equal rights for blacks has something to do with this, and the fact that the uh, the industrial union movement in general and the United Auto Workers in particular uh, promoted equal rights for blacks. I mean, the UAW had a constituency, people working in the auto factories that mixed blacks and whites, and people from Poland and Serbia and Irish descent and this and that. Uh, and one of the things that Walter Ruther, the longtime president of the UAW, believed in very fervently was equal rights for everybody. Uh, I think he was a real leader on this subject. The wa March on Washington in August 1963, it was shunned by politicians. I think one member of Congress showed up. President Kennedy ostentatiously was at Hyannisport. President, Vice President Johnson was out of town. They weren't going to have anything to do with it. George Meany, the AFL, didn't want to go there. Walter Ruther marched in that parade and led a contingent of UAW people. And he marched in a march in Detroit that uh, happened for civil rights in June of that year. Uh, and that was an important position, and I would argue an important contribution that the industrial union movement in general, and Walter Ruther in particular, made to American life. And it, it, it was one of the things that helped inspire. You'd get Democrats running for Congress uh, in Republican-leaning seats, winning time and time again in this period. In the House, in the, in the congressional elections, in each of the 10 congressional elections from 1974 to 1992, uh, Democrats won a majority of the seats in the Midwest. The single exception was 1980, where Republicans, I think, had a 61 to 59 edge in the Midwest House delegations. Not a big edge, nothing like what they'd had prior to uh, 1960s, uh, when you typically had big Republican margins in Midwestern delegations. Uh, but it was, it was those things, the, the, the Democrats, and they, they had similar things in the state legislature. So the legislatures in Lansing and Columbus and Springfield and Madison typically had Democratic majorities even when they were voting for Ronald Reagan or Gerald Ford in many cases, um, or George H.W. Bush for president. The Democratic Party had strength there, and I think that owes something to the industrial union movement uh, and to um, that sort of impulse. You have, um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's interesting. I mean, Jerry Ford's home congressional district, when he resigns, after having been confirmed to be vice president of the United States in February 1964, elects a Democrat. First time it had done so since 1910. Uh, and uh, that was one of the moves. There was another outstate Michigan race that had the same result, a Democrat carrying a longtime Republican district. That was a uh, factor that affected it, uh, that, that Nearly for one of the things that kind of foretold the d political demise of Richard Nixon. Uh, they were turning against him, and I think that reflects something uh, of the mores of the Midwest. Um, this is a region where a lot of voters, more than the national average, place a premium on honesty and probity. 
and they didn't like that, that Nixon was telling lies, uh, and they didn't, uh, and they responded very negatively to the benefit of the Democratic Party uh, at all the down ballot levels and moved the country away from uh, uh, from the Republican Party and from the Nixon presidency, not least right here in Grand Rapids where we are here at the Hauenstein Center. Um, the um, Let's, let's flip forward to the last three presidential elections. And my basic thesis here is that the attitudes inculcated in Midwestern voters, that tended to be inculcated, obviously we're not talking about every single one and so forth, by the extreme events of 1787, uh, 1854, and 1937 have shaped the results and helped, and the same factors that produced an unusually large vote for Barack Obama in the, in the Midwest in 2008, and a repetition, some little decline in 2012, also produced Donald Trump winning the Midwest and winning the nation in 2016. Uh, the same factors favoring different parties and what many people would think are rather different personalities, certainly very different public policies and attitudes. Uh, that was a, uh, I think, uh, in the case of Barack Obama, uh, one of the things that clearly favored him was, uh, uh, was being black. I have a thesis that uh, I can't prove. I, even as a recovering pollster, I can't think of questions that you could use to isolate it in public opinion. But I believe that going into the 2008 presidential election, uh, most Americans, a considerable majority of Americans, thought that as a general proposition it would be a good thing if Americans elected a black president. And it's not very hard to think of why you might believe that. And I would think, and I think that the events of 1787, 1854, and 1937 all gave particular strength to that point of view in the Midwest. In analyzing the last several elections, I have tried to divide the Midwest into two roughly equal population districts. The metropolitan Midwest, which consists of metro areas, government definitions of a million people or more. I threw in left-wing Madison, Wisconsin in addition uh, because it's a sort of outlier, uh, which is about uh, three, metro area, about 300,000. Uh, people with, in my view, regrettable voting habits, but it's a free country. Uh, and the, um, and the, what I call the outstate Midwest, from the term outstate that we use here in Michigan to indicate areas that are so benighted as not to be in metropolitan Detroit. Uh, and the, the, mid, the metropolitan Midwest casts about 47% uh, of the uh, region's votes, the outstate Midwest about 53%. Uh, actually, if you look, the East and the West all have a much larger percentage of their popular votes occurring in million-plus metro areas. The Midwest is unusual in having a, a roughly equal numbers of votes in the two regions. Um, and basically, uh, what we can see here is that um, Obama carried the Midwest generally as a, uh, uh, by a 54-48 margin, was more the Midwest was more democratic than the national average. Uh, he carried the electoral votes in 2000, um, uh, in 2008 by a wide margin. He also carried the outstate Midwest, at least the way I calculate the figures, and I use the census definition of the Midwest of um, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, North Dakota, Ohio, South Dakota, Wisconsin. Uh, it, uh, Obama actually carried the outstate Midwest, historically, the more Republican of my two regions, uh, by 100,000 votes. Um, that's pretty extraordinary. It's better than any Democrat except Lyndon Johnson and Franklin Roosevelt in the 30s, better in, than in history. It's an extraordinary vote. Uh, I think at the time and in general political analysis, we take it for granted. Well, yeah, well, you know, he, he won there. I think that it's a, given the demography and so forth, it's a little unusual for that to have happened. And one of the reasons it happened is that this long-term uh, feeling in the Midwest that it is a good thing to have equal rights for black Americans um, inculcated in Midwesterners by a lot of history that goes back a long time uh, and has been recently refreshed and renewed. Uh, that feeling uh, 
helped Obama do something very unusual, run way ahead of historic precedent, uh, not only in the metropolitan Midwest, where most of the black voters in the Midwest live and uh, of uh, the smaller number of Hispanic and Asian voters. Um, it's, it basically, if you want to find Asian voters, look at the New York Times mapping the census interactive graphic, which is really good. And uh, the biggest concentration of Asians in Michigan is grad school dorms in Ann Arbor and East Lansing, uh, <laughs> at least as of 2010. Uh, the, um, and so forth, the, the, uh, they carried that area by uh, a big, big, uh, carried that, the Midwest by a wide margin. He carries the Midwest uh, electoral votes uh, by uh, Obama by uh, a, a big margin in, uh, uh, and so forth. He's, he carries almost all of them, big, big margin. Uh, and basically, uh, one of the reasons he does so is those white non-college people um, I think with historical factors playing a part, are voting Democratic for him. Uh, that, his vote decreases slightly in the, uh, in the country, but he won the electoral votes in 2012, again, 80 to 38 in the Midwest. He carries the region by a 51 to 48 percent margin. Uh, in many ways, uh, he holds on to the electoral votes of Ohio, Michigan, and so forth with those ads. Uh, attacking Mitt Romney, who is the, uh, who is the son of an of a auto company CEO and writes an opinion article for the New York Times, which the editor of the New York Times helpfully um, headlines, let Detroit go bankrupt. Uh, those are actually not Mitt Romney's words, but they did go on his article. And uh, people outside of journalism cannot understand something that everybody in journalism knows which is that when you write an article, somebody else writes the headline. And ordinary people will say to you, gee, wouldn't you want to write the headline most of all? Doesn't that make sense and so forth? And the answer is, no, no, that's not the way it's done. Go figure. Uh, anyway, you know, it was 1937 all over again. Mitt Romney was the com evil company guys that were hurting the workers and so forth. Uh, this was shades of 1937 and it was effective. Uh, with uh, in, in the Midwest and so forth. And I think the Romney people didn't really know what was happening to them uh, on that. Uh, and, you know, Mitt Romney says, geez, I allocate billions of dollars of capital to one company after another, and the total result is more employment and economic growth, so you folks should be grateful. It's sort of an abstract argument when you've got a memory of the sit-down strike in your extended family and you've got a population in Michigan that used to be 40% union households, and when you think about it, probably about 40% or more of people and voters in Michigan had their had parents or a grandparent that grew up in a union household that were part of that ethos, part of that thinking, that that's still um, there, even though the union household percentage in the voters today is much lower. Uh, and so basically, um, what happens in 2016 uh, is that the factors uh, get reversed, work out in a different way. The Midwest's uh, willingness, eagerness, in the case I think of some people, to vote for a black presidential candidate, and not just black people, but a lot of uh, people imbued with, whether they know it or not, with this history, uh, helped Obama carry. It wasn't working for Hillary Clinton. I mean, the Clinton people, you know, started saying, well, you folks are racist, deplorable for not voting for us. Well, uh, you know, if you know people in outstate Michigan, what they would tell you is up in Iosco County, where my family has property, a uh, county that voted 51% Obama 08, 49% Obama 12, and 62% Trump 16, they would tell you, hey, I voted for the first black president. Or if I didn't, a lot of the people I see at Walmart and, ch and church voted for him. You're calling us racist? I'm sorry. Uh, that's not going to appeal to people very much at all. Uh, Hillary Clinton thought being the first woman president, as she would have been, would be an attraction. It was to baby boom generation women and some men uh, that did not appeal to the younger generation. Uh, younger women in the primaries voted for Bernie Sanders. Uh, just didn't carry the kind of weight that being black did. And I would submit that, that events of 1787 1854 and 1937 play a role there. Um, the uh, Democratic strategists uh, 
uh, thought they, you know, argued that we have a blue wall of states that have been voting consistently Democratic in the Electoral College uh, since the 1980s. Uh, yeah, what they didn't notice was that some of those states went, you know, for John Kerry over George W. Bush by 0.1 percent. It's not a very high wall, uh, as it turns out. Uh, you know, Michigan and Pennsylvania went for uh, by 3 percent. Uh, and so I think it, it, the, 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 that heritage of friendliness to black people did not work. Um, the, um, the, un, the honesty heritage that we saw in Watergate, the shift against Richard Nixon. Well, 32% of voters nationally thought that Hillary Clinton was honest and trustworthy. Uh, you know, in my political consultant days, if I'd seen those numbers for a client, I'd say, we got to emphasize a different character trait. This one doesn't really work for us. Uh, Hurt most in the Midwest, I think. Um, I wrote, but not in Chicago, and Jonathan Alter wrote me and said, yeah, that's terrible, you're saying Chicago votes for corrupt politicians. I said, Jonathan, I know your family has been very much against that, but hey, anyway, uh, the, uh, and so forth. Um, the labor union heritage, previous, uh, uh, Previous Republican nominees had been clearly kind of identified as management types. Mitt Romney, George W. Bush, um, the first George Bush, etc., cetera, uh, or sort of agrarian types like Bob Dole in the 96 election. Um, in this election, it was Donald Trump who was taking the strong position and saying, uh, you workers haven't been represented well by trade agreements. I'm tougher on trade. Uh, and the UAW and, and other industrial unions have been, in general, for trade protectionism for the last 40 years. Uh, Hillary Clinton kind of, you know, said, well, I, I'm, I'm getting out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I'm not going to go for that. But, you know, she had a voting record that was t in tension with that. That sort of labor union heritage worked for Trump, the same thing that it worked for Obama against Romney. Uh, and I think, uh, in conclusion, the, the, the history of being the most pacifist um, isolationist, dovish part of the country. Previous elections, it had been the Republican candidates more than the Democratic candidates who would favor foreign military intervention in the mid Mideast and other places. Uh, in this election, it was Donald Trump basically saying, hey, I'm against the war in Iraq. I was against the war in Iraq before Hillary Clinton was. Uh, you know, his facts he had fudged a little bit here and there, and of course he was not in the same position. Um, but, you know, it uh, just is on same-sex marriage in which Donald Trump came out for that before Hillary Clinton did. There was a, the, he, had, he had a position that was more likely to appeal to dovishly inclined Midwestern voters than previous Republican nominees had. And so what happens in the general election in our, in our three regions in the Midwest? Uh, basically, the metropolitan Midwest votes about the same way it did in 2012. Not as heavily for Obama, but still uh, pretty solid. 13.6% margin as percentage of the total vote in both 2012-2008. Ri some rich people move over away from the Republicans towards Hillary Clinton because they can't stand Trump, balanced by some blue-collar whites in the metro areas that vote for uh, Trump more than they'd voted for Romney, plus uh, black voters, but coming out at a lower percentage and so forth. Uh, the metropolitan, the, the, um, the, mid, the, the, the um, outstate Midwest switches. The outstate Midwest, which had voted by uh, 49 to 49 for Obama, by 1% of the vote in 2008, which gave Obama, which gave, which went for Romney by only a 52 to 46 margin in 2012, uh, voted for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton, 57-37. There's a, that's 100 electoral votes. That's the election. That's who's the president of the United States. And I think that it resulted, obviously, in part from specific decisions. Maybe Hillary should have gone to Wisconsin after the primary. But it's also deeply rooted in the history that we're going to be talking about all day here at the conference uh, and in various forms. Uh, it tells us that history has its, uh, has its claims and still has its ties that make a difference for us uh, and that uh, we shouldn't take for granted. And um, we should, uh, as we look at current events, also have a, um, a respectful attitude 
towards a history that in many ways of this region in particular, as well as of our wonderful nation, has helped to lead our nation in general in uh, good and beneficent directions um, under both political parties uh, over a long period of time. And uh, it's a worthy subject to go on. And I'm honored to be here. And thanks very much for your attention.